husband hears of it and says nothing to her on the day he hears it, then her vow shall stand and her obligations by which she has bound herself shall stand. But if on the day her husband hears of it, he forbids her, then he shall annul her vow which she, which she is under and the rash statement of her lips by which she has bound herself. And the Lord will forgive her. But the vow of a widow or of a divorced woman, everything by which she has bound herself, shall stand against her. We're going to stop right there. We have a whole lot to cover. So let's do the blessing after the reading of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and planted everlasting life within us. Blessed are you, O Lord, the giver of the Torah. Um, man, everybody can you sit down or get up and go grab a Jenny Munchon. I one of her many buses. Yeah. Whatever you would say. Like. What version is the translation of the moon there? Yeah. 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 Okay, everybody. We are going to get started, and what we where we're at today is it's a dual portion. Matot and Mase. Mase? Mase. Mase. Okay, we're in my, uh, we're going to, first thing we're going to cover is going to be in Numbers chapter 30. It is interesting. In the Torah portion, Matot Mase, we read about the Israelites who are on the verge of reaching the promised land of Canaan, okay, of Canaan. They have been on a 40 year journey through the desert towards freedom. Here we are at the end of the book of Numbers, and the Israelites are reaching the end of their wandering from Egypt to the plain, there's a plain of Moab. Just as the Israelites, uh, God's chosen people, are able to look back now to where they have come from and now look forward to where they are going. Uh, it's interesting here that in this, the book of Numbers, there are a lot of uh, sages who, I mean, we know that the first five books are the books, books of Moses, Torah, but they, uh, between the Exodus, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, they feel that that encompasses all of the Torah right there because Deuteronomy is basically a recap of, uh, of all of everything that has, has gone on. But here in Torah, we're reaching uh, the end of it. The uh, the first half of the Torah portion, means tribes. Okay, uh, and that's in Roman numeral one. It's, a, it's got the piece of paper, the fillings are on the table back here. But tote, oh, thank you. But tote means tribes. Okay, this portion begins with Then Moses spoke to the heads of the tribes of the sons of Israel. At the beginning of this parish, Moses explained to the Israelites the laws concerning vows made by men and women. And this is where we're going to start. In verse 1, Moses is speaking to the leaders of the tribe. Moses is about to give them instruction regarding making vows to the Lord. You realize that when you make a vow to the Lord, you are required to keep it. Okay. I think about, uh, I'll talk about it later, but I think about wedding vows. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, that, that would be a, a prime example. Uh, 
Moses, like I said, is about to uh, give them instructions regarding the vows to the Lord. So first, uh, let us look at what, what is a vow. Webster defined vow as a solemn promise or assertion, one by which a person binds himself to an act, service, or condition. But I like what the Smith Bible Dictionary says when we define vow. A solemn promise made to God. To, to perform or to abstain from performing certain things. But in the latter, I mean that very But I will. <laughs> okay. In Roman numeral one, letter A, because somebody wants it right now. Now, <laughs> Moses explains to the Israelites the law concerning vows made by men and women. So, so uh, explains and vows are the filling. I might as well give you number one. The SBB, which is uh, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, uh, defines vow as a solemn promise to God. It's very important, as I said earlier, if we're going to make a promise to God. Okay. Uh, let me grab some of the Aren't my paperwork here, so I know where I left off. And then in verse 2. If a man makes a vow to the Lord or swears an oath, he has he has bind himself to that agreement. Um, you know, we don't have to be a biologist. We know what a man, what a woman is. You know, <laughs> and the Lord, and the Lord has put in place where. You know, the men are required to do things that men aren't required to do. Okay? Take it up with the Lord and you go be with them. Okay? God is saying, if you make a vow to me, you are to keep it. This is so important to God that he spends a whole chapter on it. One thing we need to understand is, is these rule, rules on vows are from God. Okay, they're not from Moses, they're not from Aaron, uh, they are from God himself. They are direct commands from our Lord. Verse 2 uh, emphasizes that a person must always keep their word. If an oath or a vow, if it's an oath or a vow, he must fulfill all its terms, whether it's to God or man. If he doesn't, he has broken the ninth commandment. And the ninth commandment says, uh, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbors. You know, the, and this commandment deals with honesty, sincerity, integrity, and uh, it's who you are. And, uh, you know, the, the Lord does say, what if we let you get, and you can hold you know. Okay. So, now in Deuteronomy, you might want to write this down. Deuteronomy uh, 23, 21 to 23. It says, when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be a sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be a sin in you. You shall be careful to perform what goes out of your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised. So what is he saying here? You know, what, what he's saying is why if you don't have to make a vow.
I just read that it said that certain vows cannot be broken. The marriage vow and certain vows that you made. But there are some vows that you made that you can go before a council and present to them the vow that you made, and then they would decide if it can be binding or loosening. Right, right. If that was the case, it brings to mind the man who made the vow that the first thing he saw he would kill. Right, which right. Which was his daughter, which was murder, really. Right. Couldn't he have gone to the council and say, hey, I didn't want to commit murder. Right. Uh, can you bind this or can you loosen this? Right. You know, uh, what you're getting at, I mean, we're going to get to that too, but but the thing is, it's yes, hon. Uh, now, but now I think I'm good now because I could see mine going up. Okay, I, uh, Susan, are we good out there? She's talking. I can't hear her. I could just see her lips. Moving. Yes, Pastor. Yes, Pastor Vince. Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah, we got a thank thumbs you. up from Bonnie. So right now we're good. Um, thank you, Susan. Okay. Uh, with what you're talking about, one thing we have to be careful of, uh, it would be back in the days of, uh, at this time, it would be the Sanhedrin. Can the Sanhedrin overstep your the parents? Well, today, our government would say, yes, they can. Well, no, your parents ha have the say-so. They should have the say-so over, uh, you know, whatever education they decide to, that, that they would, would like you to have. Uh, I mean, there's, there's, you know, we are, we take control of our children and that's where we, the, the law should be. So when we start saying that, that there is a, a group or something like that, then I think we're getting into some shaky ground. And I didn't read that about the Sanhedrin. Yes, the Sanhedrin made a lot of decisions, but I think when it, when it came to Torah, and especially this portion where a person would make a vow to the Lord, um, they didn't get involved with that. No, but not, not on this. Not on this. Okay. You know what? Like we always say, you come to the Midrash and you have your opinion. Okay. So, you know, there's two different opinions here. Yeah. Go ahead, Pastor Bruce. In verse two, uh, there's two notable words here. One is a vow to the Lord, the other is an oath. And they're different words. And the vow to the Lord uh, cannot be broken. The oath is command. And that can be negotiated, like Maria was saying. That, there's room there for, there's wiggle room there to uh, make rulings on those things yeah. and so on and so forth. So we have to understand that. Um, I was also going to comment because as we were reading uh, when we started the parish off, you know, when the husband hears the woman making a vow that he disapproves of, he can nullify it right on the spot. Yes. And that's an important issue for you and I today because uh, too many people think that everything that pops out of their mouth is going to condemn them or, you know, uh, oh, you know, I don't want to proclaim this or, you know, the Lord breaks that stuff off when you say something stupid. Amen. He's your husband. So, I mean, is there anybody yes. in this room that hasn't said something you've really regretted? Uh, like on a daily basis? <laughs> I mean... You know, we say foolish things without yeah. thinking, and we, we, because we lack in our vocabulary, we don't know how to express ourselves, so we choose an inferior expression, and then, it, and we see this a lot in hyper-Pentecostalism, where people go, well, I'm not going to proclaim that, so they won't tell you what their issue is, and, and you won't pray about it because you don't know what it is. Look, you just say, look, here's what I've been diagnosed with. Right. And 
You're not putting a curse on yourself. If that were the case, then just start proclaiming tens of millions of dollars in your pocket for the next week. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. And we've got to understand that for the positive or the negative. Right, right. And, and it's because the Lord is always attempting. When I say something irrational or stupid or without thinking, he can negate it right on the spot. And, right. and in my case, he does. I don't know about you, but I know my Lord. Amen. <laughs> well, my wife does negate it sometimes, too, actually. But that would be a no. <laughs> so hopefully that kind of helps with this idea. And this is what this... In part, that's what this portion is talking about. Right. Not, not exclusively, but in part. Right. Right. Okay. Remember to use the microphone. All right. <laughs> so anytime we're trying to understand scripture, there's rules. And one of the rules of scripture is that man and woman together are called otan. So whenever the Bible separates the woman from a man, it's the man is the Mashiach, is Hashem, and the woman is us. So this, this scripture actually is giving us permission to, when we, well, not so much permission, because um, it says every word that comes out of your mouth, right? It's showing that every word that comes out of your mouth is a vow, number one. And number two, if it's not backed up by scripture, if it's something that the, the creator has not spoken about, right, then the vow stays. But if it's something that the, the creator has spoken about, then the vow is nullified on the spot. So I know you guys know about the Kol Nidre service, right? Yes. Okay, young people. And that is the release of all vows. And this was a big discussion with Maimonides and his peers at that time. Because he had converted to Islam under pressure. And so when it came to the Kol Nidre, or when it came to Yom Kippur, right. he wanted to be released from that vow. And they went back and forth whether or not he could do such a thing. And we also had the Inquisition at that time forcing Jews to become Catholic. Right. So they specifically made the Kol Nidre service before you start Yom Kippur to nullify any vows that the creator would not have supported. Right. So we have a couple times in scriptures where vows are nullified. Right. One of them is um, in the uh, case of Nehemiah and all those weddings where the children did not speak Hebrew. They they dissolved all those marriages. Mm -hmm. And then there's um, there's a first vow in um, in scripture. Most people don't know what the first vow in scripture is. Remember, Adam um, is a parable, and he's trying to. Um, his main goal is to vindicate the creator, which should be always our goal in discussing Torah is to vindicate the creator. And um, and so he shows when he starts speaking, the first thing out of his mouth is a vow. He says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Mm -hmm. And he even goes on to say that he will even leave father and mother to be one flesh with his wife. And so this is extreme, you know, like to death. I'll keep this right. up. And, and it shows later on how that vow gets them in trouble. You know, this is Adam keeping his vow to the woman, right? Um, and it cost him his life. And it also caused him separation from father, which was God, and mother, which is the word of God. So the Bible, is, what Adam is trying to communicate is that you should not say a vow, right. especially anything that contradicts the creator because he made them full time. As far as uh, parents having authority over their children, that's your Shabbat law. Remember, it says Otam, them, yeah. right, are to keep the Shabbat, and they are supposed to control son, daughter, male servant, female, female servant. Notice that they do not say husband, wife. They're Otam. They're considered as Otam. Wow. So when the Bible is separating here to where it's saying a woman who is a daughter, or, you know, um, married, or she's a divorcee, or she's a widow, right? Uh, all four cases, it's the woman separate from Otam. And so anybody who's making a vow out of their mouth, 
who says something that contradicts what the creator wants or has said, is considered to be cut off acting singly and not open with the creator. Mm -hmm. So right. this is the this is one of the um, this is our race section. We're actually in a race divide right now. And this is when um, we have Cain getting upset and he's angry. And the creator is telling him, if you do tati, then you will be fine. But if you do not do tati, then lies at the door, yeah. right? Yeah. And that's exactly what happens. When you say things out of your mouth, every word out of your mouth is some type of um, uh, vow. It's the power the creator gives us. And the creator, like the pastor said, can nullify it on the spot if it contradicts anything in his Torah, because we are his daughters. Aren't you glad he does that? Amen. Amen. Yep. So, uh, so, and, and you know, and like what was said, uh, you know, the whole thing is why make a vow if you don't need to, you know, just, just, just don't do it, you know, but if you do do it, you know, unfortunately for the men, if we do make a vow and we're the ones who put our foot in our mouth constantly that, uh, you know, if we do make a vow, we are obligated to keep it. You know, uh, the women, you know, you you have an out, you know. Our, well, our only out is the father, uh, father in heaven slapping us and, you know, you fool, you know. <laughs> You're, I'm not going to hold you to that. Or... You know, there's three, vows, three types of vows. Yeah. Three okay. Yeah, we have to use the microphone. Okay, there's three types of vows mentioned here. Right. They're all different. The first one is from um, Cain when he was told to be a Ned and a Nah. Okay, that was his way of repenting. He had been a murderer and a liar in his heart, and now the Creator tells him to be a Ned and a Nah. And in fact, those those two letters in the Shema. Mm -hmm. Right, are in Lar. Those two letters of the noon ein and the noon dalit um, are enlarged in the Shema. So um, that's um, there's a lot of information to what those are, but and that there is a vow of repentance. A uh, Shavua, which is a um, it's a law of keeping Shabbat. It's the laws that you make when you go into the land. And an asper is the law of a journey, some type right. of journey that you are intending to go on, right. uh, whether or not it is um, something that you're going to complete for Hashem. Right. Okay. Thank you. Let me grab my camera. See, one thing too, and I'm glad you mentioned a lot of this, but a lot of this, I could see some of the eyes like, you know, because it's, remember, you're speaking to people at a kindergarten level, you know, or, or at least first grade level, and we're getting some college stuff here, so, you know, but uh, you will be held accountable, so be careful of making a vow or oath. When we read through the verses in chapter 30, uh, 2 through 17, we realize it's clear that this section is not um, only about vows per se, but about women's vows. We're going to get into it where they're just, it's, it's all about the women. A woman who lives in either her father's house or her husband's house and pledges something to God is pledging something that is not, the way I read it is it's not really hers which she is in fact does not have the authority. Thus, the man's responsible for this woman making the vow either as, either as a duty to consent and then be liable to, to de deliver her vow or to nullify the, the pledge on that day he hears it. Uh, thus, protecting her from punishment owed to a person who makes a vow and doesn't fulfill it. So the so you uh, like I was saying earlier with the women, you know, you're still under the authority of either your your father or your husband, you know, 
And uh, one thing we did read is where uh, the woman gets married. You know, maybe the father didn't say anything, but her husband, he surely can say no. You know, I disapprove of that, nullify it, and, and that's the way it's going, it, it, it will stand. In verses three to five, it focuses on unmarried women still living at home. To God, uh, to God, she is still under her father's authority. A man submits to the Lord, a child submits to a parent, and a wife submits to a husband. Here in verses three to five, the unmarried woman is under uh, her parent's authority. It is her father who determines if a vow made by his daughter is valid. You know, that just uh, shows you how responsible parents are, especially the father. You know, we, husband and wife, when the Lord made us and we became together from two, we became one. Okay, so we have to take that seriously, that we have a responsibility for, for I know for Peggy and I having our grandchildren living with us, six of them, uh, you know, we love it. We love it, you know, because uh, uh, there's been mul multiple times already with two of my grandkids where they wrote a report honoring their grandparents. So it's, it's, uh, you know, when they live in our, but then again, when they live in our house, it's grandma and grandpa's rules, yeah. okay? They're not going to bring in, and we've seen this recently with uh, some youth coming into our house and violating those rules and getting kicked out of the house by our grandson, you know? So uh, remember that uh, when you become a a parent or grandparent, if some of you already are, that it's your rules, you know, the, the you know, it, but it's funny. I saw a t-shirt that said um, something to the effect that uh, my grand, my grandkids make all the rules, you know. <laughs> I got a 22 month old and oh yeah. <laughs> so um, and I'm getting I didn't hear it. Anybody else? No. Um, well, I did. I had it at sixty-four. But I was I was told I was told by Deanna that upstairs, if upstairs is on, this will be off. If okay, all right. Uh, oh, go ahead, Maria. So, if I was foolishly made a Nazarene vow, would I go to the council, the pastor, and say, "Look, in a in a moment of need, I made this vow." And I know I can't break it because there's no temple to break it or sacrifice. Can you loosen me from this vow? Can they do it? Or am I stuck being in the rest of my life? Well, according to uh, the midbar where we're at now in chapter 30, uh, no, we cannot. But according to what we're reading here too, is uh, if you make a foolish vow, you know, Yeshua is not going to hold you accountable for it. So it's uh, binding and loosening. Like, I mean, it's loosening. Where do you all <laughs> to loosen it? <laughs> Loosener. <laughs> I think one thing we always have to remember, and, and sometimes, um, when we study Torah, which is a set of instructions or a set of rules or codes for living, uh, and of course, in the, in the worst 
case law. But when you study something like that, the propensity that human beings have is to become extremely legalistic. Uh, because there's something in human beings that, that feels uh, that is performance driven. I mean, our entire society is performance driven. The, the, the whole world operates on performance. And there's no way around that. The problem, the problem with that uh, is, is when you come into the spirit realm, uh, we're not really performance driven. According to the Lord, we're grace driven. And we have a hard time reconciling the two because they're total ends, opposite ends of the, of the spectrum. So we always have to remember, I would say, always season everything that, that we learn with grace. Now, grace doesn't trump Torah, but does Trump does does Torah trump grace? They, that, that's a that's an issue that we have to contend with. If it was based, if our salvation was based on complete obedience to Torah, there's nobody here going to have period. Nobody. So grace becomes a huge factor. Now, of course, the church, the Jew, the synagogue puts the emphasis on the Torah. The, the church puts the emphasis on the grace. This is why the two need to come together. Because without coming together, you only have half the package. Right. Period. So <clears throat> the church understands 50% of it. The, the synagogue understands 50%. And this is very much like a marriage. In a marriage, you need both people to complete or or present the whole mm -hmm. and and, and uh, so I think we have to remember that so when you I mean we know people that have made Nazarite vows we know people that sacrifice lambs on Passover I mean people are insane they're just nutcases uh, this and and of course it flies in the face of Torah that's why I say that they're they're crazy they don't understand the word. They don't read the word. They do uh, what their base instinct tells them and how they're they're interpreting the word. And so I feel that we need to lean on grace for that. Because all of us have made fatal error. Amen. So hopefully that is, is I, I realize it's not a clear cut answer to your question. But I think it's something we have to contend with. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's difficult. There's things in Torah that yeah. uh, that aren't really completely spelled out. People, people yeah. break the marriage vow. Yeah. I mean, fifty percent of believers have broken the marriage vow. So where do they stand? Yeah. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't think you can just come along. And and use the sword to, to slice that and say you're just out of the picture, dude. Right. I mean, we we had we've had people leave this congregation because we have people in leadership that have been divorced. Yeah, that's right. And I understand what they're saying. I understand where they're coming from, but I I believe they're wrong. And of course, I have every one of us has to stand before the Lord on your own. Yeah. <laughs> No one's going to be standing with you when you stand before God. You're you're there, and you're going to give an account. And and I'm convinced of this. I think we need to be able to look the Lord in the eye if that's even possible, and say, you know what? I did honestly. I did the best I knew to do, and I was moving in faith. You're not going to yeah. fool him. Well, yeah. So he's not a gay player. Yeah. We have to. Yeah. He covers us when we're sincere. You know, in the first, uh, first, uh, in the in the writings at the time of the, the temple was destroyed, the Didache, the Didache, 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 the Didache says that it says if you can't keep all of Torah, keep as much as you can. 
you know, and some of the people that like what he was talking about, you know, I don't know if I'd call them nut cases, you know, uh, for reasons why they left, but I do know that we've had nut cases here. I mean, somebody who left because they didn't like the color of the carpet. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, my gosh, you know, but uh, but yeah, it, it, this is this is tough. The, you know, but you know, it's not spelled out. I had another person ask me in the past. It's not spelled out here in Torah, and this, and it's not in this Torah portion. <clears throat> what if grandchildren are living in a house, and the only adult male is the grandfather because of a divorce situation? <clears throat> That's the way it is in my house. You know, I am, I am the authority in my in my house. You know, so I've taken up that role as being being their father you know but let's get back to it the father has an important responsibility and they shouldn't take it lightly i think today uh it's been taken lightly i mean uh some people think their father just because they went out and got somebody pregnant they're not part of the family they're never there but they they oops they, they tap themselves that i am a father <laughs> But uh, but it's uh, let me do this again. So the father, like I said, the father has an important role in. Uh, let me get this. You know, in the home, and it says uh, it says that if he hears the vow and does nothing, her vow stands. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a disinterested father with no relationship with, with uh, his daughter. I know that I want to hear what my grandchildren have to say, you know? And when they say something, I want to see, you know, especially with Peggy and I, what we want to do is we want to be, uh, you know, make that decision. Okay, I'll get to you right now, Janie. I would, I would one way or the other respond. It continues in verse three and five to say that if a father hears it and disallows it, then the vow does not stand. Now, this sounds like a father who listened to his children and he reacted. Go ahead, Janie. Uh, Lord has led me to be reading in Romans. I usually read in the Old Testament, uh -huh. but I've been reading in Romans and First Corinthians. And it's been a very sobering experience because the Lord is showing me the plan of salvation and the details of it, which are just perfect. And the Lord has been showing me how great, in, in my capacity to understand it, how great God's mercy is mm -hmm. and how great His grace is. But I keep going back to uh, something that Pastor just said. He said, God covers us when we are sincere about our actions, thoughts, and words. And I know for several months, I, I keep hearing a uh, pastor in the services preach about um, the essence of the law. It's not that we're getting rid of the law because we, we know that Yeshua and the prophets came to fulfill the law. Uh, or something along that line. So right. we know that the fulfillment of the law is still with us and we're still responsible for that. Right. But the pastor continues to talk about the essence of the law. Amen. What does this mean in terms of the blood of Yeshua shed on the cross for our sins? Amen. And you know, and uh, Janie is absolutely right because even the, the, you know, the rabbis, they take students under their wing. And when they take these students under their wing, it's not that the students are going to supersede their rabbi, but they can become just like the rabbi. So who's our rabbi? Our rabbi is Yeshua. So Yeshua would desire more than anything that all of us would rise up to the level. You know, when we do nothing, oh, we're not like our rabbi, you know. But when you come here, I know I'm speaking to the choir, but when you come here, your desire is to learn and to, you know, be more, uh, you know, acceptable, you know, to, to our, to our rabbi. 
now in verse six to, to eight is now dealing with a woman who's going to be married to her fiance. If she makes a vow before she is married and brings it into her marriage, her new husband, like her father before him, now has the authority to allow it or disallow it. So if the father was disinterested in his daughter's vow and let it stand, now her husband can come to her rescue. Okay. okay. What can we say about verse 9? Verse 9 states that widows and divorced women are held accountable for any vows that they make. You know, as Valerie was stating, you know, I mean, you, you don't have that male figure there, you know, you're, you're widowed, you know, so, so, but even today for those that are widowed or uh, divorced, uh, you know, you have Yeshua. You know, we've, we've got, uh, we've, we've got Yeshua who can come, come to your rescue, you know, if you make a dumb vow, but, I, and I know that the, those that are here that are divorced or widowed, I know you don't make any dumb vows, right? So, right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Before, <laughs> Okay, let's go. Uh, let me give you uh, number two. Number two is Yeshua said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything beyond that is evil. So Yeshua and evil are your fill-ins. And, uh, and, and that's just another way of saying why make a vow? Why commit yourself to something when you don't have to? Okay, let's look at three areas where we can make vows intentionally or unintentionally in your personal life. This is a vow, promise, or statement you make to yourself or in the presence of others. Some people make these personal vows without knowing it. You know, I mean, you might have an example, but I put down, I will never get over the pain of what you did to me. That is like a personal thing where, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to hold this grudge against you because of what you did for me. That's not only, uh, that is more detrimental against you than the other person that you're uh, holding it against. Okay. Um, or, or I will never be free from this sin. Don't hold yourself in bondage. You know, because that's what you're doing. Go ahead, Pastor uh, Bruce. Yeah, I was going to say, we were talking, James brought up the idea of the essence and, and really what's behind the, uh, an issue. You know, there's a big difference between, you can have two people that say, I, I, I can never forgive you for this. One actually never forgives you. Yeah. And that's, that's a problem. That's, that's the way out of line. Yes. My own mother fell into that category. Yeah. She never forgave me for many things. Okay. So, but how many of us use that expression because we don't, because we're trying to express the amount of pain and hurt that's been caused? I don't know if I can ever forgive you, or I don't think I can ever forgive you. But then later down the road, they come around and they go, you know, let's just move on. This is ridiculous. There's a huge difference in those two actions. Right. And the Lord knows. Does the Lord not know the beginning from the end? Yes. Well, he does. So when we, now I'm not saying you should make those kind of statements, obviously. We, we need to be careful with what we say. I'm not saying otherwise. But we also have to understand that we say these types of things without uh, really thinking through what we're saying. And it really isn't what we feel. How many of us say things that we, you know, Kathleen, sometimes after I, I teach you, why'd you say that? You don't <laughs> even believe that. I said, I know. <laughs> uh, and, and, and guys, it's because on the, on the spur of the moment, you're, you're thinking in one vein and you're speaking in another vein. And and, out, and then you go, okay, should I go back and correct it? No, I'm not going to do that because that's going to take 10 more minutes 
and it's going to breed even more confusion. So you just hope people understand who you are. You hope people understand the essence of who you are. People kind of go and say, well, so-and-so said this. And I go, well, you know, it doesn't sound like them. That doesn't sound like something they would say. Right. And and what, what do you base? You're not saying they didn't say it. You just say that seems a little out of character for them. So you know, if we give that kind of grace and understanding, does not the Lord? Oh yeah, much more. And, and yeah. let me make one, just one other. At the risk of of uh, hyper spiritualizing the, the context here in Numbers, when I realize this isn't the context that I'm going to speak to, but I I want to address it because what we're talking about is being under covering here mm -hmm. and it's so important you know if the woman leaves her father's house and immediately goes to her husband's and why is that important because there's there's a spiritual covering that's involved in this process mm -hmm. and we have to learn that even in the church because people a lot of people think they're Abraham oh the Lord just told me to go somewhere and they tell me where to go no, that was for Abraham. That wasn't for you. God gives you a destination. Yes. Now, I'm overstating it. I realize God can do whatever he wants to do. But to just leave some congregation and float around until you hear the voice of the Lord, you're going to be consumed by the devil. It's simple as that. Because the the the... The words that don't forsake that covering. You've got to have it. Right. So if God's moving you on, you wait until you know where you're headed. Yeah. You know, you you wait for that. Those that wait on the Lord. I mean, I mean, you know, that's very important. You know, wait, wait on the Lord. But you know, I'll, and I'll go on. Uh, did anyone else? Okay, go ahead. Actually, Abraham was um, told where he was going. Yeah, he was. He <laughs> was. No, I use that because people just people just uh, people just kind of assume that Abraham just left his father's house and wandered. You know, the Lord said, "Go to a, to a land that I will show you." Right. That, that's a lot different. You know, you're going in anticipation of being shown. Yeah. So he didn't know the exact destination necessarily, but he knew he was going to know it. Yeah. You know, yeah, people yeah. use that scripture all the time in the church. Yeah. Oh, we've had, yeah, you're absolutely right. We've had that here where a person asks that they, I, I trust in you, uh, you know, if you would give me some counsel because the Lord wants me to go certain places or whatever. And I said, okay, let me pray. And then I'll come back to him and I'll say, no, you're not supposed to leave. Well, they left anyway. So, I mean, uh, it's so, so much for they trust my, my counsel, but, but uh, you know, and then something happened. Then they get there and just, I'm not even going to get into it, but then something happened and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, you weren't supposed to leave, you know, but. But so be it. Okay, let's get back to uh, some reasonings. Um, I don't know if you ever heard this one. I'll forgive you, but I won't forget. Or I will never forgive what you've done to me. You know, um, I know a person is here and I don't want you to comment, but there was a person that um, I told uh, because of what was put on her, uh, just this happening. And I said, don't ever get a hold of that person again. Don't ever. I said, there's one thing, but there's one thing you can do. Pray for that person, yeah. you know, but, but it seems like every time um, you try to, you know, something would happen negatively. So finally I had to step in and say, don't ever get a hold of that person again. Just pray for that person. Okay, now, and then there's something, huh, this one here, or speaking over yourself, I will always be poor, I will never, or I will never be healed. There, you know, don't say those things over yourself, you know, uh, th these are the ones that hopefully, prayerfully, the Lord nullifies and says, you know, <laughs> knock that off, you know. Uh, this one I've heard before, maybe you have two. 
I've been to many churches, but have still not found the perfect one. You know. <laughs> They showed up. Yeah, I was going to say it was perfect until you showed up. You know? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, these are all personal statements made to yourself. Uh, the devil will use this against you to continue reminding you of your failures or telling you you cannot overcome it. That's just the way it is. The devil is so wrong. The enemy is so wrong. Uh, because there is victory in Yeshua, yeah. and that's what we're talking about here. We have victory in our our Messiah. Uh, you can write this down in Matthew 12, verses 35 to 37. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting uh, for it in the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Ooh. <laughs> and, and like I said before with, with, with Yeshua, Yeshua said, yes or no. You know, and he says, just yes will be yes, no will be no. Anything beyond that is evil. Go ahead, Maria. In one of the lectures that Pastor Bruce had, January 4th, 1965. Point wasn't on the note. You said that once a word is uttered, that it just goes on and on forever. It right. never disappears. It's there. <laughs> yeah, that 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 is right. But but when I was when I was sharing that, and when I share that, the, the context is sound waves never end. They don't grow weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and then finally just dissipate. Sound goes forever. So when you speak something today, it goes into tomorrow. The tomorrow, we talked about this in, in cosmology study, physics study, tomorrow hasn't been created yet. So you're sending forward life or death. You're sending you're, what you're doing is you're exposing your your plans to the enemy, so to speak, which is not smart in warfare. It, it doesn't necessarily spell disaster, but it certainly can. Right. So you, so you want to send good things ahead, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, I use the example. I don't think it's uh, just because you say it, it's predetermined it's going to happen. Otherwise, I just proclaim that next week I'll be a millionaire. <laughs> and well, let's make that a billion, actually. The billion doesn't go that far anymore. A billionaire. So, is that how many of you believe that's actually going to transpire next week? Not next week. Like, oh, <laughs> you can believe? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But you see what I'm saying? But when it comes to the negative, we just assume that it's an automatic foregone conclusion, and it is not. Right. right. It is not. It, everything that's spoken, everything that's done has a, has a reciprocating response. Right. Their reaction is an opposite and equal yeah. reaction. We know that, right, from science. We also know that from the scripture. Right. Don't be deceived. God is, is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he shall reap. So when you send out a negative word like that, you may not get the fullness of that, that word back, but you will, it does affect you. Yeah. 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 You no, know, and I remember many years ago, many years ago, a study that we had here and uh you know, there's still a lot of people out in this world that don't believe in creation, you know, 
But one thing, uh, we're talking about the satellite, I forget what it was called, that they sent out there. And it was uh, sound waves that they sent out. Well, the sound waves went out and then they bounced back. Kobe. Kobe. Was that the Kobe yeah. set? And then the, the net, then they did this study again uh, a, a second time. And the sound waves went out, they went a little bit further and then came back. You know, so what that was proving is that there was a beginning. There was a beginning. The, and they also say the sound, the 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 sound waves that go out, it went out at a certain speed, you know, 3,500 years ago. Today it's going out, but it's not going out as fast as it did before. So that's telling you that there is a beginning and there will be an end, you know? So with all this, you know, and this is science. This was all science, you know? So that's why sometimes when you hear these people follow the science, well, I would really love to see them follow the science. You know, everybody in this world will be believing in Torah. Right. You know, in follow the science, it points to the Bible. It does. It absolutely does. But that was, we haven't had that in ages. But, uh, you know, it was wonderful. Even our guest speakers that we had, I don't, you know, I really didn't remember Kathy until after we sat there for a while. And then I said, oh my gosh, you know, because it's been, uh, we, well, it's been a long time. So I remember buying windows or, or sending money, but I wonder what, I must've been here at that time, but you're talking about 30 some years. I've only been with the congregation 28 years. So I just remember taking up a collection, you know, but, but you know, it was, it was wonderful. We had a nice little Shabbat service. Okay, another area where we make vow, a vow, and this vow is intentional. These are vows made in marriage. The vow is uh, neder, N-E-D-E-R, neder, neder. In Hebrew, uh, it, it's a promise to God, okay? There were many at your wedding, or maybe there were just a few, but every godly wedding had the Lord present there he was a witness when we pronounced our vows uh do you remember when you said i will take you to be my wife or husband to have and to hold from this day forward for better for worse for richer for poor in sickness and in health to love and to cherish till death do us part okay this is a sol solemn vow and as I said, not only family and friends witness this, but God too. As time passes, many have forgotten their vows. God does not forget. <laughs> he was there at your wedding and he is with you now. Marriage is important to God, so it should be important to us. If we think about Yeshua's first miracle, his very first miracle, it was at a wedding. His time had not yet come, but he made an exception at a wedding. And it was God who made marriage, not man. You know, so when we get into, uh, when we have to go now for a third time to define uh, marriage, because uh, you know it's going to happen twice already, California has said, no, marriage is between a man and a woman. And both times our government, our state government has not recognized it. They don't care. They don't care. So if we go a third time and again, say it's between a man and a woman. Well, then for a third time, they won't care. Yeah. Okay, I'll get off of that, uh, <laughs> that pedestal, you know. Okay, all right. <clears throat> One of the first mentions of a vow is that of Jacob. We're going to get to about three places, and we'll hit the one that you you uh, touched on, Maria. Uh, turn to Genesis twenty-eight in chapter eight, in uh, chapter twenty-eight, verses eighteen to twenty-two. Uh, so Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head. And he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on, on its top. 
He called the name of the place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then uh, Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I learn and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Okay, let's jump over to Genesis 31, 13. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me. Now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. Okay, so in Genesis 31, 38, we read that Jacob had, a, had, had served Laban 70 years, or 20 years, I'm sorry, 20 years. It was now time for him to leave. 20 years after Jacob made his vow with God, Jacob, I'm not saying he did, but Jacob may have forgotten his vow, but God didn't. Vows are taken seriously by God. Here in chapter 30 of Numbers, Moses tells the leaders that if you make a promise or say you will do something, you must keep the promise. A vow or oath before God is no small thing. So all this time, uh, Jacob was with his uncle Laban. God protected Jacob. In fact, he prospered. Okay. He is now reminded and told to leave. And now he, he Jacob, will return to what God has for him. 20 years. You know, one reason he was there was what? To find a wife. And he did find a wife. Uh, he finally found a few of them, right? <laughs> uh, we won't go there. That's not this parish shop. But <laughs> okay, we read another vow in God uh, in First Samuel. Okay, if you turn to First Samuel, we're going to go in chapter one. You know, you know this story. It's a story of Hannah. She could not have any children, though she desired to have children. Her husband was very kind to her and loved her, but she wanted children. It didn't help that her husband's other wife had children and would remind her of it and rub it in on her. A wisely Hannah, or Hannah took her situation to God. So we read here, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 1 in verse uh, 10 and 11, she made, a vow and, she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but I will give your maidservant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and a razor shall never come on his head. Who are we talking about? Samuel. Yes. You know, and I've, I've uh, read about this. You know, she wanted a son. But on top of the son, she had promised a Nazarite vow for her son. Could her husband nullify that? Absolutely. And I would imagine he heard of it and he just let it go. I don't know if he let it go because he thought she can't have any kids. She'll never have a kid, you know. And then when she finally did, maybe he forgot about it. But uh, we read further on that God gave Han uh, Hannah uh, her desire, a son, and she names him Samuel. God had fulfilled his part of the agreement. Now what is Hannah going to do? Okay, there was no question of what she was going to do. It didn't even, she never thought twice of it. Okay, after she had weaned him, she took little Samuel to the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And there Samuel served Hannah's example. Uh, uh, there Samuel served. Okay, 
Hannah's example showed how proper vows were. A righteous woman was Hannah, and likewise, she gave birth to one of the greatest prophets of Israel. I say one of the greatest prophets of Israel, but to the Jewish people, this was the greatest prophet. Okay. So in the book of Judges, we read of a foolish vow. The story is in Judges chapter 11, and it's in verses 30 and 31. And it starts here. It says, if you will indeed give the sons of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's. And I will offer it up as a burnt offering. What a, well, at that time when he said it, he probably thought it wasn't foolish at all. Because what, uh, what, if you give me this great victory, and it was going to be a great victory, because if you, if you read about it, the amount of men that he was going up against, it's impossible for him to get victory, and he did, okay? Jephthah, Jephthah desired victory so greatly that he gave no thought to his part of the agreement. God indeed gave victory, and on his return to his home, we read in verse 34 what came out of the doors to meet him, okay? Uh, what it says is when Jeff, Jeff at, came to his house at Mitzvah, behold, his daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. Now she was his only one, his only child, Besides her, he had no son or daughter. So when you think about it, wow, he's going to give up his daughter as a burnt offering. Think again. But I know there are some that believe that. Okay. His heart was filled with grief for what he had done. But being a man of his word, Jephat kept his part of the vow. His daughter asked to be given two months and she went away. Because of this, many, many commentators feel that she was not offered as a burnt offering, but served the Lord and remained a virgin all the days of her life. There are those who feel that her father did offer up as a burnt offering. We have those that in a previous Midrash agreed with that. But I'll tell you, our God does not take delight in human sacrifices. This was a pagan custom, and many times in Torah, many times in Torah, God tells the people, you are not to be like the pagans. You are not to be like the other nations. So uh, on this one occasion, to think that uh, this child was given up as a burnt offering, I think not. I don't think it ever happened. Uh, now, should we make vows today? God tells us in Matthew 534, but I say to you, do not swear at all. So here again, we constantly come into uh, the word where it says that if you don't need to make a vow or an oath, don't do it. You know, don't, don't just don't do it. James writes that it is best not to make them so we do not fall into uh, judgment. Uh, we should seriously think before we make a vow. And what are we requesting or what are we uh, promising? And can we make good on what we promise? You know, uh, how many times have you heard, uh, you know, when I win the lotto, you know, I, <laughs> Exactly. So, you know, our society is plagued by people failing to follow through on uh, their agreements. Our politicians many times promise and not deliver or just flat out lie. Go ahead, Tila. Well, this, this um, so when you say, I love the Lord with all my heart, all my soul, with all my mind, and all my life, okay, that is about, is yeah. it not? 
I, I, it is, and that would be a promise or a vow that, you know, I think it's a it's a positive. And you're right, it is, it is. And then what happened? That's why it's so important to uh, ask for forgiveness, repentance. You know, return back to the Lord, because uh, when you make a promise like that, I think I've made promises like that one uh, many times. You know. And then when I put my foot in my mouth, you know, and, and like you sometimes, Pastor Bruce, I get reminded from my wife. So, <laughs> but, but thank, the Lord thank you. Wives. Thank you, Lord, for wives. Yeah. For a wife. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, even in our praise and worship, I'm always reminded we are we're telling the Lord, you know, I love you with all my heart. I will serve you. I praise you. I bless you. And so we need to know God takes that seriously. Amen. 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 You know, and that's why when we come into service, <clears throat> you know, and I don't know, I, and we can do that. I know I get the backlash. I, especially one person always tells me, well, I use my cell phone as my Bible. Well, put it aside and open up a Bible, you know, because when you use it as the Bible, then you constantly skip over. And while the word is being uh, preached or said, you're using your phone to look up something else or whatever. Just put it away. You can, at, uh, at Shabbat, you can go without a phone for two hours. It can be done. You know, you know I had a conversation with my great grandson he's only nine years old and papa and i and i tell him i say what and he says uh let me use your cell phone i said no you don't need my cell phone he said yeah you know and, and then he says everybody needs a cell phone he says you can't you can't go on without a cell phone <laughs> so i told him i said cisco i said how do you how do you think it was back in my days when there was no such thing as cell phones? Oh, his eyes opened up. There was no cell phone. I said no. Yeah. <laughs> that reminds me of when one of my grandkids, whether one of my grandkids or one of my kids said uh, something like, "Dad or Grandpa, did you shoot Indians?" <laughs> watching his cowboy and Indian program. <laughs> so I'm old, but I'm not that old. <laughs> but, it, but it's funny, these things that the children, they just don't realize. And a lot of times, put that aside. You know, I don't know how many times uh, when we're on my way to work or whatever, and Peggy says, where's your cell phone? I'm, oh, I don't know. You know, so... And I end up having a wonderful day without it, you know, <laughs> or I get a phone call. You know, I text you. Yeah, but I don't have my phone with me. And they like, what do you mean you don't have your phone with you? I don't have it with me. You know, go ahead, Valerie. All right. So when Adam is giving his testimony, there is a word that is never mentioned in his in, in the first five chapters of the Bible. And that is the word love. It is never, he never gives us any impression that man loves God. In fact, the Bible in Genesis, the word love is only mentioned two times. And it's the love that he had for his son and the love that um, Esau had for Ripa. The only two times in the Torah. Right. Okay, so, so basically men are um, considered murderers and liars right from the beginning right so of course when you take the word of a murderer and a liar so how how do we make a vow to god because in this number uh section it's giving us permission to make three types of vows vows of repentance right vows of keeping shabbat and vows of covenant so what the bible calls a journey the creator trying to reconcile with us right so in 1 Corinthians 12, 3, it says, it says, um, no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says that Yeshua is a curse, and no one can say Yeshua is Lord except for by the Holy Spirit. 
So when we speak in the Holy Spirit, we can make a vow. Mm -hmm. Because the Holy Spirit doesn't lie. The Holy Spirit will be believed, right? And what we say in the Spirit is eternal because nothing, we'll never say anything wrong in the Holy Spirit. And we have the opportunity to give vows in Hashem while we're in the Spirit. Mm -hmm. So when we're in worship and we're worshiping God and we're in the Spirit and we're saying all these wonderful and lovely things to the Creator, right? We're saying it through the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Only thing I would say is when I open up into Genesis 1 1, to me, it's all about love. You know, his whole word to his people, it's it's a love story, you know. You know, and he asked, and what is it? How many nations did he, did he ask to be his people? And they all turned him down, except the Hebrews, except the Israelites, the only one that accepted his terms and his conditions. But, uh, but yeah, I know what you're saying. But like I said, this is a book all about love to, to God's people. Okay, in Proverbs 20, 25, it says in the Living uh, Bible, uh, it is foolish and rash to make a promise to the Lord before counting the costs. Pro Proverbs 10, 20, uh, or 10, 19, 20, says don't talk so much, but <laughs> it says don't, don't talk so much. That's a word of advice. <laughs> You keep putting your foot in your mouth. Be sensible and turn off the flow. When a good man speaks, he is worth listening to. But the words of a fool are a dime a dozen. You know what? I think they are. Proverbs 10 is uh, talking about many of our politicians. You know, uh, so watch out what comes out of your mouth. In Malachi uh, chapter 1, verse 14, 114, it says, But cursed be the swindler who has a male in his flock and vows it, but sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name is feared among the nations. And this is one of the verses when Yeshua came in and, you know, flipped over all, all the tables uh, at the temple, you know, uh, it there was so much going on there, so much swindling. You could have brought a perfect, unblemished sacrifice, but then the people there before you would enter would inspect it and say, oh, no, this isn't as good. But for but for forty nine ninety five, I can give you a uh, you know. And then they would take yours and whoa, the next person I'll sell this sixty nine ninety five. You know, <laughs> okay. God will not be mocked in Galatians six chapter six, verse seven and eight. We are told, "Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap." For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap, will, will I'm sorry, the flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Um, just as you said, Valerie, you know, the spirit. Yeah, right to the point. So, so, so the, the thing is here, do not try to pull a fast one on God. <laughs> At the end of chapter, <laughs> you're not that fast. You're not that fast. <laughs> At the end of uh, Numbers 30 in verses 10 to 16, we read that a husband confirms his wife's vows either in silence or vocally. Go ahead, hon. ¿Qué pasó? Back to what we were talking about, um, I don't know how much that's good, but where he kills his daughter, he doesn't yeah. talk to her. No, I don't think he, he does. Did. He sacrificed. He made a somewhere vow. Somewhere in there, I read yeah. somewhere where somebody, you know. But, and people 
want to try and justify and say that it never happened. And maybe it didn't. I don't know. I don't think. But how is that any different than today? Yeah. Where you read about a mother shooting her children or they she drowns them and then she kills herself or so and so. You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, know in other you, words, if, yeah. if, if a thousand years from now, they say, you know what I heard was going on back in the 2000s and the 1990s, and they used to kill their children in the womb, and, and some of them would take them out, and then they chop them up and put them in the trash can. And how is that any different? I, I, I don't get it. And, and I have to tell you, because I worked well, I still work in an area where I used to, I was in real estate call. And next to me was a child abduction. And there was a conflict going on between a husband and a wife. And both of them wanted to claim the, the son, I think it was a little boy, about 18 months, maybe two years old. And they end up giving it to the father. And the father comes to pick up the child and the mother is crying because they're, they're there. You, you see the mother first dropping off the child. You guys don't understand. You can't do this, blah, blah, blah. So she leaves because they can't be together. And the father takes the child. And I'm there. I, I hear everything going on because they're right next door to me. And we always talk. One hour later, they get a phone call. He killed his child. Okay. This is what, I, it's like, how is that, when people look way back at us, how are we any different today than what was going on back then? Could that have happened? Yes, I believe it. I don't, I, I think this is a, a little bit different because what you're speaking about is evilness. Evilness that has taken over this country. But that was and evil. in Canaan, it was all evil. That's why God's people had to go in and drive the inhabitants out. And that's what we're going to get Judges into next. talks about a lot of that. Like yeah. There was, the, I mean, the one where that's where I think, but I like think that's the thing where they chop somebody yeah. up. Well, but I think in this, in this uh, situation, uh, the person's not making a vow. What they're doing is there, it's just their evilness that is going to do something i wouldn't even say that this man even knew who the lord was but uh, uh were you going to jump in pastor bruce yeah. okay yeah go ahead yeah i was just going to say in response to that that one thing we don't know what the outcome of that was is is so did he uh kill her did he not kill her we, we don't know what we do know though is in this particular case that it's clearly a reference the Mashiach, uh, and and what the Father has spoken to us, that he's going to give his son, he's going to be a light for the nations, and so on and so forth. And so when you're dealing with that Logos word, you are under a different set of precepts in many instances. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the prophets that spoke Logos word are a lot different than the prophets to speak uh, a rhema word in, in the Brit Hadashah in New Testament times. So they were, if they said something that was didn't come to pass, they were to be stoned. Right. Now, we, there are certain problems with even that statement because uh, Isaiah said things that didn't come to pass for 800 years. And he wasn't 800, he didn't live to be 800. So the rest of his lifetime, it never came to pass, but he was never stoned. So we have to understand that when you're dealing with a logos word, in other words, of the word that's in in the Bible, the the foundation, uh, there's a different set of of uh, rules. I I'm not taking a stand either way whether he went through with it or he didn't go through with it, but it's clearly uh, a, a a representation towards the Mashiach that that the Father uh, is going to allow his his son to be to be executed. So it, it leaves us in a quandary. Right. Right. Yeah. 
And that's my final word. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's unfortunate with, uh, you know, and, and, you know, I think I said it before that we aren't, we are called, we're called out. We are not to be like the nations. I would imagine that back in the late uh, 1700s, early 1800s, we separated ourselves and we became, we became a godly nation. I can't say that today, you know, uh, things have things have changed you know now instead of being separate from all the nations we are just like the nations unfortunately uh, even if you go to israel today especially in tel aviv tel aviv is like west los angeles or uh west hollywood or whatever it is san francisco yeah so uh things have changed you know uh it's like i said i think a lot of it uh here uh Instead of speaking about the vows, we're speaking about evil. And uh, there's a lot of people, if they are making a vow, they're making a vow to the evil one. So enough said on that. But uh, our Lord takes, uh, takes vows seriously. In chapter 30 of Numbers, it began with the Lord giving instructions on vows. And in the end of it, God's telling Moses, these are the laws uh, concerning vows. So uh, we're going to move on from there. And letter B. We're going to talk about Israel wages war against the Midianites. War is your fill-in. Okay, so in chapter 31, begins with the Lord speaking to Moses. God commands Moses to take revenge against the Midianites. So Moses sends 12,000 men, 1,000 from each tribe, and Phineas the Kohen, the, the, the priest, uh, the Israelites, they went out to war against the Midianites and they killed every male, including Balaam and the five kings of Midian. We talked about this a little bit a couple weeks ago, even mentioned it last week. Why would Balaam be there? Here it is. We read two Torah portions ago in Balak, at the end of the parasha, it said that he had gone home. And I was, we were talking about that. He lived over by the great river, meaning by the Euphrates River. That would have been, I did a little bit of geography, and that could have been a little bit uh, of a right around 475 mile journey for him to go home. Moab, and that's from Moab to the Euphrates River, depending uh, where where he lived so now here we are in this uh uh chapter he is back on the scene and and uh and we talked about it why would he come back on the scene money for balaam it was all about money he at that time to the nations not to israel but to the nations he was known as this great sorcerer. He can predict things and they come true. And if with the right uh, amount of money, he will come and he will service you. Well, he, I don't know. I don't think he got paid. Some people say that they believe that he did get paid for his service to Balak. I don't think so because uh, he couldn't curse Israel. And God made sure that Balaam would not curse Israel. After, before he left, he gave him a little bit of advice. And that was the route that they went. So when he came back, it was because uh, he heard about the 24,000 that had died. And he, was gonna, and he wanted to come back and receive payment on it. So, <laughs> so the Israelites... Uh, they take the Midianite women, children, and all the possessions back to Moses and to Eleazar. But before they leave, they set all the Midianite cities on fire. So every city, every town, uh, they set it on fire to destroy it totally. So they, what do they do? They come outside the camp or, or outside the camp, Moses and Eleazar, 
the, the high priests are there to meet them and to greet them. And here comes the conquering army. Job well done. Everything is going swell. And then Moses gets angry. Why did Moses get angry? He gets angry because the officers brought back all the women, even those, even those who were involved with enticing the Israel men to sin at the incident of Peor. We have. We read it. Uh, we've read this before. And uh, here it is. He gives them instructions. Okay. All the non-virgin women were killed along with all the male children. Some of you had problems or with how would he know that this woman was not a virgin? You know, um, okay. My thing was he killed all the male children, all of them. All you have to do is think of in the book of Esther, who is the crowning uh, evil one in that story? Who, Haman, okay. And Haman was a uh, child at the time that wasn't killed at, at one of the conquests, okay? And this is what happened. They grow up, even today, a lot of these children, I was reading an article out of, uh, out of Israel about the Arab children that are growing up and they are standing there and these are like eight, nine-year-olds just lifting up their fists, uh, condemning Israel, and that they were going to be martyrs uh, in the in a future time. So this is what happens. So this, so uh, Moses gives the instruction to kill all the the women that aren't virgins and all the male children. The Israelites take the, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Only the young girls who had never had relations with a man were kept alive. God tells Moses to divide the plunder. There was 32,000 women. There was 808,000 animals. So I made a little list here to go through it. Um, so the, the plunder at that time that they brought back uh, and which was in addition to the spoils that the army had, okay? So it was like 675,000 sheep. They're taking this back to the people. 72,000 cattle, 61,000 uh, donkeys, uh, 32,000 women uh, that they brought back. And they were going to be, end up being made, uh, servants or, or slaves. So half of that portion went to the people who had went out to battle. They, they, they divided that. The other half went to the children of Israel. Okay, so this, the army, but then after it was all over, this is something uh, that's noted here. The army officers approached Moses to inform him of a miracle that had happened in this war against the Midianites. Does anybody know what that, that miracle was? Yeah. What is it, Maria? Share it with everyone. Microphone. Microphone. None of the Israelites that went to war died. Not one person died. But it says the military commander took offense. Wasn't that against God? God did not want censors taken of, uh, with his. Well, of, and this wasn't of all the people, it wasn't a census of all the land. This was just, you know, when you go to war, no, it's not even a sin. When you go to war, you take accountability. I know that if I, uh, I think uh, Mary and Joseph would have been wise that when they returned after Yeshua was, uh, was bar mitzvah, that uh, that they would have found out early on that Yeshua wasn't with them. But in other words, they looked around all their men. And, you, and remember, 
a, a general or a commander is in charge of all their men. Well, what they did is, oh my gosh, let's see, you know, well, who did we lose? Okay, they use the word census, but they look around to see who did we lose? Okay, so um, not one Israelite, Israelite life was lost. 12,000 men went out to war and 12,000 men returned. Because of this, the army officers gave all their plundered gold, all the gold. That's uh, here, I'll give you half, I'll give you a quarter or whatever. But it was such a miracle that these commanders decided that everything we took in, all the gold that we took on belongs to God. So as far as uh, uh, a census, nope, it wasn't, you know, I think the words are being used there, but, uh, you know, you're going to, it's just like here, if something should happen in here, what's the first thing at work? When I'm at work and if there was a fire and I had to clear that building out, I would have to find out, is there anybody still left in that building? So I would have to go around and start counting. Who was first? I was just gonna say that Moses was told the commanders to count out a thousand men. So that wasn't a disobedience by counting to see if there's still a thousand men. So we're told to count a thousand men. A, a census is just, yeah, the, just not the whole army of the thousand men of the, from the tribe. The, the ones men. that were called, the ones that most that went to war to actually pull out. So, told the commanders to pull out a thousand from each tribe. So it wasn't, it wasn't a, um, it wasn't the sin of David. No, not at all. Yeah, it wasn't the sin of David. Go ahead, Pastor Bruce. I think when it comes to the census, uh, you have to realize too that it, it goes back to the essence or the intent of the heart. If you're taking a census so that you are going to lean on your numbers to say, well, they only have so many soldiers, but we have this many. So, you know what? I'm going to take a little more land. That's a problem. Uh, but but if you have an army and you're going to send them into battle, you have to know how many swords you need. So you've got to know the count of the number of men you have, how many how many rations do I need? Uh, you know, if you send an army out to fight a battle, if they're out there for five days, you need enough rations to, to feed them for five days. That's so, right. so that be, it's a it's a difference in the intent. It's a difference in the essence. Yeah. So, although counting is just like uh, we don't count here, and the reason we don't count is because scores don't don't count because in pastoral circles. When you meet another pastor, the first question that's ever asked is how many people you're running. Sounds like a cattle farm. And that's exactly what God doesn't want. Because if people aren't cattle, they're not numbers, they're, they're human beings. Right. They died for. However, when we do a, uh, an oneg or a, or a, yeah. well, Sukkot coming Sukkot. up, Sukkot. we yeah. have to take the count. We have to know how many campsites do we need. Right. That's so right. we've got to know how many people are coming. So that is a. Because I'm at the top. So I know. Yeah, you have to count. I, I know how many people come every yeah. week. But right. see, the intent, yeah. but the intent of the heart, we're not counting the numbers. So I can go to a pastor that's got a smaller congregation and say, well, gee, if you were just yeah. doing it the right way, you know, you'd have a lot more people. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and pastors fall into that category, and that's absolutely wrong. Right. So that 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 becomes the essence of the census. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and roll and uh letter C, the laws regarding the spoils of war are outlined. That's where we're at right now. So spoils is your fill-in. And then in letter D, the tribes of Reuben and Gad are granted permission to stay on the east side of the Jordan River. So I think so. Yeah. I, I mean, we're. Yeah. God said 12 
scribes were to enter. Right. Reuben, Simeon, and Gat, all of them from the beginning of time, they they, yeah. they went against. They should have just wiped away the whole. Well, no, the sages say that. They they say that, you know, in fact. Here, we'll get to that. In chapter 32, begin with the tribes of Reuben and Gad de deciding that they would rather live on the east side of the Jordan River. Go ahead, Pastor Bruce. Uh, what I would say to that is that we have to remember, and I'm not disagreeing necessarily, but we also have to realize that that too is, is somewhat of a, I, I can't say a messianic prophecy in the truest sense, but the land of Israel today is not the land that was promised to Israel. Oh, no. It's a very small portion. The portion actually goes all the way east, which would include these two tribes. Yes. So this could have been a prophetic word or gesture towards the future. I'm not saying that that's what it is, but it certainly could be that. So we have to look at that. So again, we're stuck with that dilemma. Was it did they miss God or did they not miss God? Right. If you read in uh, 30, 32, 19, Reuben says, for we will not have an inheritance with them. He, he went, he, it's like shaking your fist in the face of God. They stayed on the other side because they wanted that side. And they said, we will not have an inheritance with the rest of them. I'm not arguing. I'm not arguing. No, but, but you can also take it as we will not have an inheritance with them speaking of that land. In other words, that land now can be divided more, uh, give more land to the other tribes since we're going to be on this side. Okay. No, there's always other, uh, like I said, you know. There's always other reasoning. Go ahead, Kathleen. Well, I always see that as the church that refuses to cross over because I don't want my inheritance. Oh, I, I, I agree with you. That's why when you're saying that, I'm just giving you different approaches to it. But I think, uh, well, here, let's go on. There's the reasoning for Reuben and Gad wanting to stay on the east side. Their idea is the land was large enough for all the amount of cattle that they had. It was lush green land for their cattle. Moses at first relents. If you read it, at first he relents. But then he gives in to Reuben and Gad and agree to, uh, and, and they do agree because Moses says that you will come across and fight with your cousins. You know, you are going to come over and you are going to, because we're going to take over this land, this promised land the, that was promised to us, and you're going to come over to the land of Canaan and drive out all the inhabitants with us. Well, they said, yes, we will. In fact, it is true. They did go in. In fact, uh, the tribe of Gad is one of them that was right up front. They were like the, the first battalion that went in there. So they did. They were men of their word. Uh, Manash, on the other hand, uh, they wanted to make sure Reuben and Gad don't do anything uh, ridiculous. So Manasseh was given, the half tribe was given part of the land on the east side of the Jordan and on the west side of the Jordan. So, and, uh, and it, as for Manasseh, uh, the tribe, they built 15 cities and they conquered Gilead and Canaan. Uh, later, even this is what I was going to get at too, uh, Maria. Later, even though the tribes of Reuben and Gad had already settled on the east side of the Jordan, they would realize their mistake because as they were going through the land of Canaan, they realized that it was a land flowing with milk and honey. It was much better land on the west side of the Jordan than it was on the east side. It may have looked, you know, real good pastures out here, but the better ones were in the land of Canaan. <clears throat> I agree that, uh, you know, here it is all. It's, I wonder what Moses thought. Here we go again. 
you know, these these uh, twelve chieftains or priests or princes of uh, you know, I send them in and ten come back with the bad report. Now here we got two others that are following falling into the same routine. Uh, it would have, you know, but as Pastor Bruce said, originally that land is supposed to go all the way to the Euphrates River, you know, up in present day Syria, Lebanon, and, you know, up, you know, so <clears throat> it's a vast amount of land that the people of God are going to inherit, you know. A lot of people think, how are we all going to fit in this little portion of Israel? No, it's much bigger than that. You know, it goes all the way to uh, the Nile River. So that's part of Egypt. You know, so uh, it's it's a much, much bigger land that was promised uh, to, the, to the Israelites. Okay, in Roman numeral two, moving right along, Masay equals journeys. Journeys is your fill in. Okay, in chapter 33, we begin the second half of the dual portion, Mato, uh, Masay. Masay means journeys. And in this chapter, it will cover all 42 camps from the time they left Egypt to the last camp before the people crossed the Jordan River and entered the Promised Land. Uh, Parasha uh, Maset. Masay begins with a list of 42 different stops at which the Jews encamped during the 40 years in the desert. Most readers just skip right over this and they go through it very quickly. I like what Rashi said. Rashi notes that the list of journeys demonstrates that Israel did not spend 40 years constantly wandering from place to place. He counts only 20 journeys because at the beginning when they left Egypt, there was a lot of stops going up to Mount Sinai. And there was probably about roughly 10 stops in the very last year as they were moving through there. Well, Rashi says he counts only 20 journeys in the 38 years between the rejection of the land and Aaron's death. To Rashi, this is more evidence of God's love for Israel. He says, although God had made a decree that they would wander and travel in the wilderness, you should not suppose that the wandered and traveled, that they wandered and traveled continuously from one place to another for all 40 years and that they had no rest. Uh, in Numbers 33, 53, it says, you shall take possession of the land and live in it, for I have given the land to you to possess it. So uh, Rashi says, uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, and then one thing too, I like, I like what it says here. It says, uh, it says, he has made known to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nation. Psalm 111.6 says, if the people of the world ever say, oh, in the, talking of, that was in Psalm 111.6. It says, Rashi says, if the people of the world ever say to the Jews, aha, this was way back when, you are robbers illegally occupying a land that belongs to other nations. Israel can reply, the whole world belongs to the Holy One, blessed be He. He created it and He can give it to whomever He wants. It was His will to allow the Canaanites to live in Canaan. And it was His will to take it away from them and give it to us. Okay. Rashi anticipated that the Jewish right to the land of Israel would one day be a challenge by the nations of the world. Um, boy, was he spot on, yeah. you know. <laughs> you know, the one thing, too, about the, uh, the command to live in the land of Israel, uh, it, it says is a weightly and is weightly on all the commandments of Torah. 
of all the commandments of Torah, it is, uh, it is, you know, to live in the land, you can now start uh, observing all his commandments fully, is, is what he's saying. And one thing I noted here, in FFOZ says Messianic Jews, and we know this, Messianic Jews who apply for citizenship in, modern, in the modern state of Israel are often rejected because of their confession to the belief of Yeshua. When they find out that you are a believer in Yeshua, you're nixed, you know? So, uh, so it, it, it's very important. I know that if I apply to become a citizen, uh, it would have to be a miracle. But you know what? Citizenship. Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Barbara Streisand's brother applied for citizenship and because he visited the Messianic website, he can receive applause for the nation of Israel has been for years. Yeah. And they don't care who you are. You know, President Trump. President Trump can go in and say, I did this and I did that. I want to become a citizen. Nope. Nope. Yeah, she's got, yeah, she tried up her, her funds to Israel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And okay. Something like that. Yeah. 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 And, but they didn't, they didn't uh, budge, or the you know. Time. Yeah. They, they haven't budged. Yeah. That was just a Disney. Yeah. So in letter A. Okay. A lot of people don't understand this, but it is against the law to share the gospel in Israel. Not just in the Arab nations. I got into trouble in Bethlehem uh, for sharing the gospel, and uh, they can lock you up. Right. It, it is against the law to share the gospel of Yeshua Hamashiach. In the land of Israel to this day. Yeah, that's why I was surprised when uh, when Valerie shared with us that uh, Jews for Jesus are now allowed in in Israel. They have a a building. A long, that, was, that was oh yeah, that was after, after a long. That was after a long process. Right. Yeah, exactly. Oh yeah, I know it would be, and I'm surprised that they even after the long court battle that they granted. They're not like in in the in America where you can uh, you know battle it and uh, you know it goes before the uh, the judges and you know but it goes on and on and then eventually you you may win you know usually in Israel it can go on and on and on and on and then you know what happens it goes on and on and on you know it never happens and they figure if they can't come up with a ruling that's just like saying forget it. I mean, obviously, yeah, they, they overlook it. What you have to kind of get into the politics, but you know how in America we have strong lobbies? Yes. Yeah. Well, the strongest lobby in Israel is undoubtedly the uh Orthodox. The Orthodox Jews. And so when I say it's against Israel is a secular nation by by every definition. So the secular politicians, they make their laws and and everything's fine until the Orthodox come in, the lobbyists come in and say, no, we're not gonna go for that. Then they can put the kibosh on it, but uh, I should clarify, against the law is probably an overstatement. Uh, it's, it's really objected to. The average person on the street couldn't care less. Right. They will stop you because you were talking about. Oh, I've been stopped. Yeah, on Tuesday, uh, when Ted moved the ship off. Yeah. They they stopped, they stopped them. Oh yeah. yeah. So so it's kind of a, one of those in between things. It's it's kind of like here we have a lot of things that aren't you know the mask mandate mandates are not laws, guys. There was never a law you had to wear a mask anymore in the United States. A mandate is not a law. It's a strong suggestion. At best, right? But we comply, and then they try to enforce the mandate as a law, and that's happening in a lot of arenas in America today. And it is the same concept as what we see here with the, the Jews in Israel. 
you know, the gospel. You know, and talking about that, it's even now they want to uh, put that mandate back into effect. That's right. And and what I'm seeing is even some of these cities where they're very liberal, they finally are fed up with it. And they're saying, no, we are not going to comply. You know, so, uh, you know, that that's a whole nother thing. But getting back here, letter A, uh, a list of 42 camps from Egypt to Moab just before they entered the promised land. So that's what they're going through now is a list of the 42 camps. Okay, God tells Moses to drive out the inhabitants of the promised land or face punishment. You talk about a, a vow, uh, God makes a vow. <laughs> you drive out the inhabitants or face punishment. Well, what happened? They didn't drive out all the inhabitants. So what happens? Were they punished? Absolutely. Okay, but in verses 55, 56 of this chapter, God tells Moses to say to the people, if you do not drive out the inhabitants, of the land from you, then it will come about that those whom you let remain of them will be like thorns in your eyes and like pricks in your sides. And they will trouble you in the land in which you live. And just as I plan to do to them, I will do to you. To this day, Boy, oh boy, how the Jews regret not driving out all the enemies of the land. Even after the Six Day War in 1967, they had the opportunity to drive out all the enemies from their land. In fact, they were even picking up all their stuff and heading towards the Jordan River. And they told them, stop, stop, we can all live in peace. Well, that was back in 67. How is it right now? Are they living in peace? Not at all. They should have just, you know, yeah, cleared the field. Exactly. You know, so, so that's, uh, okay. Now, in letter B, Moses tells Israel to remove the current inhabitants of the land and he also told them to destroy their gods. So remove and destroy are your fill-ins. So when we get to uh, chapter 34, uh, God tells Moses to tells Moses the exact borders of the promised land. To the south, it says the southernmost border was at the desert of Zin, and it extended from the Mediterranean Sea uh, all the way over to the Dead Sea, okay? That would be the southern border. And, you know, the northern border extended to uh, Zephron, which is today, uh, it's up in uh, part of uh, Lebanon, Syria, that area up there, that would have been the northernmost border. And going east, it would have extended all the way to the end of what, what today is Syria. Coming down, um, it would have taken in all of Jordan, you know, and it would have taken it down if you go all the way down, even down to the Dead Sea. And that would have been their eastern border. So in letter C, the boundaries of the land of Israel are defined along with those of the Levitical cities and the city of refuge. See, in chapter 35, God tells Moses where the Levites would dwell. 48 cities, including six cities of refuge for murderers, three in Jordan and three in, Can in Canaan, in Canaan. In this chapter, we are told the difference between murder and manslaughter. A murderer must stay in the city of refuge until the high priest died, the Kohen uh, Kadal. Uh, he cannot be killed by anyone based on the testimony of one witness. So if there was one witness and saw it, that wasn't accepted. There had to be two witnesses, okay, or more. 
uh, he cannot be redeemed with money. You cannot buy his, uh, if he was uh, guilty, you cannot buy his innocence with money. Uh, not like today. Uh, but uh, at the end of the chapter, God tells Moses to speak to the Israelites and tell them not to defile the land. It says, so you shall not defile the land in which you live, for blood defiles the land, and no atonement can be made for the land for the blood that is shed on it, except by the blood of the one who sheds it. So you shall not defile the land in which you live, in the midst of which I dwell, for I, the Lord, am dwelling in the midst of the sons of Israel. The Lord was right there. I remember we were talking about this one time, that if a bo dead body was found in the land, okay, who was responsible for it? It would have been the closest city where the person was found. They would have to uh, go out and bury this person. They were responsible for it. Okay, so in, uh, in letter D, God makes a precise distinction between murder and manslaughter. And then we get into uh, the Torah port. The Torah portion here ends in Numbers 36. With the instructions that the daughters of Zelophehad will not be cheated on their inheritance if there was no son born to the family. They were to be guaranteed the retention of their family estate, but they must all marry. If you remember that when we read in the previous parish hall, that they must all marry within their own tribe. There will be no transference of lands between the tribes because that's prohibited by God. And isn't it wonderful, the, these women of God, these women, they understood this and they all married within their own tribe. So this is something that, that the Lord, that through Moses, even through Joshua, they never had to cover because it didn't happen. They were women of integrity, uh, women of honor, and, they, uh, and what they desired from the Lord in return, they, ga they gave it you know, back to the Lord, whatever you say. And he said, you can't marry outside your tribe. There was a problem if they did, if they married outside the tribe and then uh, they had sons, well, now those sons, the land would be in, in, uh, an inheritance to them. And that would have caused conflict. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, none of this conflict occurred uh, right here in Torah because all the women married within their tribe. Okay, uh, and, and like I said, and that avoided the conflict. So in letter E, the laws of inheritance as they apply to the Israelite, Israelite women are explained. And as I said, in number one, the daughters of Zelophehad married within their own tribe. So Mary and tribe are the fill-ins. We rushed a little bit through this, uh, but uh, we had a nice little parasha here. Next week, parasha, we are gonna be getting into the book of Devarim, the book of Deuteronomy. Well, it's a custom, it's a tradition that when we end, a parashah. I think I put it on your notes. Okay. Uh, we all pronounce this blessing. Okay. And uh, so if we all can just say it together. The best Hebrew you can possibly say it in. Okay. Okay. Hesak, Hesak, and Hesak. Be strong, be strong, and we will be strengthened. Amen.